dissatisfaction, we have some unfortunate business. Um, my co-founder, Meg Giant, had a visa issue, and she did not make it out here with me. So unfortunately, you only get me. Uh, I completely understand. If any of you want to just walk out now, try some of the other talks, uh, they're probably going to be good as well. Um, but so I've already taught you something about dissatisfaction and disappointment. So, you know, you may want to stick around for more immersive design gems like those. Um, so, <laughs> Meg and I were planning to give this talk together. Um, I kind of had to turn the tank around at the last minute. Um, this is not the talk that I most wanted to give to y'all today, um, but hopefully I will have a useful thought or two um, for you, and hopefully you'll find my terrible presentation slides to be sympathetic. Uh, so, Meg and I were going to start this talk bit of background on each other, just so everyone would understand, you know, why we get to be here. And by the way, I'm really uh, enjoying the hospitality in Montreal, so thank you for your wonderful event. Um, but uh, yeah, we, uh, the fact that Meg's not here kind of lets me go on and fan out a little bit. I don't know if any of you know any British people, but if you've ever tried complimenting them, it's like throwing a cranberry to a deer. They don't want it, it just startles them. So uh, yeah, the fact that she's not here. Anyway, oop, anyway, this is me moving past this, former games journalist and narrative designer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we are Red Queens. Uh, Red Queens is our own upcoming little story studio. Um, and while it's still very early, kind of soft launch, is, is this a good volume? Because I can't hear myself. Am I yelling? There's a, there's a volume variety. Oh, the mic is cutting out a bit. Uh, maybe, should, should we all put our hands up until someone comes here? Hello? Anybody? Oh, no. All right, so what if I hold it nicely to my mouth like this and speak in a steady way? Do you hear me okay? Okay. Um, but if at any point there's difficulties with the audio or you've really missed something, can I rely on you all to put your hands up for me again? All right. So um, I will tell you a little bit about Red Queens during the talk, although it's still early days, um, in the hopes that some of the um, ideas and approaches that have been exciting to us will be exciting to you too. Uh, I'm one half of the company with Meg. Uh, we do writing and narrative design together, as well as consults, which you know means we create stories, and we also work with teams to help support their story process um, externally. And I could probably just kind of stand here and give an entire presentation on what I like most about Meg's work and the manner. It's coming. It's cutting out again. Oh no. Would you be willing to, how long will this take? I will continue, and then I will try to switch to a headset so that I can hear what you all hear. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so yeah, uh, I could probably just stand here and give a whole talk on what I appreciate about Meg's work and the manner in which she works, um, and why I feel lucky to be collaborating with her now. Um, but I will try not to spend too much time fanning out. Um, to keep it short, Meg's game, 80 Days, inspired me as a writer and later as a game designer. Um, it's the lens through which she and her co-writers interpreted the classic Jules Verne novel in a way that both revived and critiqued it. Who's played 80 Days? So oh, good, a fair few of you. If you haven't, you should, um, especially if you're interested in storytelling. Um, so what I mean by uh, revived and critiqued is where the original story was like about an indefatigable you know, British dude with the courage and entitlement to adventure around the world. Uh, Meg in particular, I think, brought this really um, subversive and really structural eye to it all. Uh, and in the 80 Days game, the player ends up thinking, let's say, a lot less about how grand are the ambitions of man and a lot more about the people who don't always get to take the wheel. And she brings that lens to everything she does. Um, she enriches everything she touches by noticing that we are not empowering, which is a little bit of what this talk is about. Um, if you give me a minute, I'm going to try to switch to a mode by which I can hear myself so that I can know what you're hearing and what you're not hearing. Narrative design. Yes. 
guess we don't have it yet. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, I'm going to continue. As designers, we have the unique opportunity to offer agency, which of course is around a lot in these lectures. Um, that it isn't simply. All right. So back to this. As designers, we have the unique opportunity to offer our players agency, which is um, a word that we use a lot at these game design conferences. But to me, it's not just that we supposedly allow the player to do something or that the player, quote unquote, feels like they matter. It's that when we give the player the power to do something, we should also ask them to consider the context in which they do it. Um, sometimes it is more interesting to say to the player, not necessarily necessarily no, but like, yes, but, you know, asking them to give up something, to receive something, can subvert the usual kind of power fantasy dynamics that often conflict with telling, you know, nuanced story. Uh, Meg gave a talk at GDC one year, and it was called Forget Protagonists, um, and it was because she cared for all the characters who stand at the wayside of the typical hero's journey, you know, the ne nebulous villagers that the archetypal conqueror, you know, visits and plows through. Um, the way Meg's work um, focuses on giving agency to other characters and in fact to the world itself has always inspired me as a writer um, and later as a designer and in my own work and in our work together now I try to look for opportunities where I can do the unexpected thing with something familiar. Um, so I, um, how many people know Reigns Her Majesty? Oh my God, really? Oh, thank you. So um, this is a game that I was the lead narrative designer on. Uh, I set out specifically to mash up social media justice critiques with Renaissance in intrigue in Her Majesty. Um, and I've been really influenced in so doing by the kind of moments that Meg designs um, because she has an innate sense of how to complicate the player's desires. Um, and I've learned a lot from that. Um, it's interesting when you know the thing that seems the most desirable is probably wrong. Um, and it's also interesting then some, when something that we dismissed suddenly offers a reward. Um, when we can't rely on simple transactional data, you know, when we can't you know, min-max a story, we get to experiment meaningfully with our desires. So I keep having these nightmares where I'm giving a talk and suddenly one of the slides has inappropriate material on it and I have no idea how it got there. Um, so now you all get to live my nightmare along with me. Narrative design. Um, so speaking of desires, another thing to know about me, um, and this is also a big part of why Meg and I came here today, is that I absolutely reject the idea that mainstream entertainment or pop music or popular culture is stupid. Um, we always seem to reserve you know, a particular derision for stuff you know, women and girls like. And in general, I think we, we could have a lot more interesting entertainment as a society if we were less committed to codifying what is supposedly good. Um, that being said, Fifty Shades of Grey is awful, <laughs> and not even in a fun way. Um, you know, it's occasionally kind of troubling where its values are located. Um, generally, though, it's just really boring. Um, the main narrative tension comes from the fact that, you know, the guy refuses to have any relationship other than a strictly BDSM relationship, but the girl wants a normal relationship, and for some reason they keep hooking up anyway, and he mails her loads of iPads, and he stalks her in every facet of her life. Yes, I did read the books um, where I could get through them. Um, seriously, though, sometimes it's just, like, super, super boring. Um, I try to maintain a psychic connection to popular culture. Uh, Americans may know famous TV psychic Mama Cleo. Uh, she passed away not too long ago, and now this is the type of woo-woo stuff I can fill the talk with now that Meg didn't come. Um, no, seriously though, I, I do find it useful as a creator to try to understand what it is about something that's resonating, even if it's outside the frame of what I would conventionally enjoy personally, or whether I would not want to make that myself. I'm still curious. Um, and I have all these high-minded theories about Fifty Shades, like, oh, it prognosticated how white women would willingly become conservative Trumpian stooges, right? That sounds good, right? Um, but willingly, honestly, like, I can't quite get my head all the way around it. All I can come up with is that it must speak to some kind of unacknowledged dissatisfaction that the readers are experiencing in these times. 
um, sometimes feels like a bleak error, right, to be making consumable entertainment. We live in a post-reality world where medieval, like medieval diseases are back. Um, climate disaster seems imminent. Um, our attention spans, as we know, are supposedly being whittled away across all these different screens. We have all these weird live action remakes. They gave Sonic individual teeth. Like, personally, I think this is because um, revisitation and reinvention are really common in periods of time when people cannot see the future. Um, and I think if we do get the good fortune to look back on now, um, we're going to... Anxiety. We're going to see this anxiety pervading a lot of the things that we created. Everyone still hear me okay? Thank you. All right. Oop, let's say. Oop. So yeah, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but if you look around right now, fashion, culture, color palettes, computer graphics inspired by the year 2000 are back in. Anyone seen a lot of Y2K stuff back? Um, it's so weird to go to, shop, to Topshop looking for like giant 60s earrings as I do and see clothes that were popular in the year that I got out of high school. Um, back in the year 2000, we joked that some giant disaster Y2K bug was coming to shut all the technology down. And these days, I think some people might be wishing for that again in some sense, you know, some kind of reset in internet culture, um, some kind of reset in the world. I mean, the giant, like, wide leg raver pants, those are back. I'm really worried that the high, the low rise, like, hip hugger, you know, jeans are coming back as well, because I cannot wear those. However, I think our fantasies matter more than ever in these times. And if there's one thing that seems worth learning from Fifty Shades of Grey, it's that there are massive audiences out there with vivid imaginations that are so desperate to be catered to that even being catered to badly means a whole lot to them. Like, I want to know who are the Fifty Shades women? And like, don't they deserve more? Like, what were they hungry for that was satisfied in those offensive and terrible little books? And what did that narrative friction satisfy for them? Like, why now? And is that something I can design for? Because I'd like to. So um, part of why Meg and I wanted to do something like Red Queens together is that, you know, in our careers so far, uh, we have found a lot of doors seem to open for us as the industry became, uh, you know, more interested in diversity initiatives. And, like, Meg and I are relatively privileged hires. So, like, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's already kind of not a great state of affairs if I'm a diversity hire for someone. But, you know... We have been, um, and we've had some really good experiences and been well supported at times. Um, but when it comes to the traditional industry, um, we have this common experience of being brought on for like our voice or you know our perspective. Where meanwhile, our actual design ideas are somehow quite challenging to implement for people. Um, even still, I get more well, not more, but I get I still get too many offers to correct some dude's crappy story or to like validate his facile women characters. Um, I get more chances to do that than I get to design the story myself from time to time. Um, and it's still too often that we're treated as niche peripherals, even by people who claim to view us as valuable. Anyone in here had that experience before? Yeah, some of you can relate to that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue. Um, yeah, so in that respect, I feel like we have something in common with the Fifty Shades women. Like, we know how to print money. We know how to reach people, but nobody respects us from time to time. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, and, and again, for more marginalized people than me, the opportunity to be heard is even less, and that's something that's really significant to consider. Um, we have found other kinds of things recently to be really rewarding. Um, Meg made a Titanic game with Storyscapes about dating while the ship is sinking. I had a really fun time uh, writing some bits for the 2019 Love Island game, which is made by the wonderful Fusebox team in London. And uh, Meg and I both have ended up being genuinely moved by how engaged these audiences on mobile are. It's a long time now since the times that we could think of these players as casual. Um, the player bases for games like these are you know very hardcore very dedicated. They have internal vocabulary. They do internal role playing. They make memes. They make fanfic. They're so creative. And there are millions of them. Like, I want to say that there's like something like seven, eight, nine million players on Love Island only. I'm bad with numbers. Please look it up. But these are huge audiences. Um, and, and they spend money too, which is one of those things that I wish didn't matter. But like, you know, the data is out there that this audience is engaged and they're ready for stuff and they want it so bad. 
Um, so, <laughs> and for me personally, I have a history of dealing with, you know, self-identified gamers for like the first 10 years of my career as I worked as a games critic. Um, and since then, I've had incredibly validating and refreshing experiences in the mainstream. And that has helped catalyze my thinking about what Meg and I both you know, want to create in the world and for whom. Uh, these eager aud audiences want new stories. Um, and, and there are a lot of interesting companies out there in the space right now, and it's a very challenging space as well. So I don't want to come in here and be like, oh, everything sucks and I have the answers. But I think in general, these players are not being served a huge amount of quality or variety. Um, I think that a lot of big companies are still too socially conservative about what the fans want, as if it's too risky you know, to do a gay storyline, even when the demand is obvious and we can quantify it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but like, even with the quality issues and the junkiness and the sameness, the fans, you know, their passion uh, persists in spite of that. They have a threshold for being messed around that let's say you know, we find relatable. And um, we think it's exciting to think about making things for and with them. Um, you know, everyone should have an outlet for their fantasies in these times, and we think that there are going to be increasing opportunities for all of us as game designers, you know, to reach broader audiences who are hungry for stories and worlds. So for Meg and I in particular, we identify a lot with dissatisfied women of all types, and we want to make great things for them. Who watches American Horror Story? Ah, oh, this is my favorite show. Kathy Bates is a vampire hotel concierge. Lady Gaga is in charge of the hotel. Like, I would probably literally kill someone to get to make an American Horror Story game. No, I mean, dissatisfaction. It's powerful in women. Um, so the standard way we tend to think about dissatisfaction in game design is this idea that a good choice is one where you know, we give the player what they want, but we also kind of make them feel like crap about it. Like, ooh, maybe you missed something, but you're going to have to play this all over again if you want to find out what. Who's seen that choice before? Who has made that choice before? Come on, we, put your hand up if you've done one of these choices. I've done it. We've all done it. Ooh, doesn't that feel good to admit it? <laughs> right? So people whose hands are still down, probably in marketing or analytics, that's just as bad. Come on. Um, so, uh, oops, I guess not prepared for this, um, but the reason that we keep coming back to that sort of thing as designers is because game, produ game production has unpredictable short calls, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes you just got to throw something in there. Um, it's actually pretty hard to make a sophisticated network of affordances in which we alternately thwart and reward the appetites of a wide range of players across a narrative map that's perfectly balanced like a cabalistic tree, such that every avenue statistically validates the resources that we've spent on that. That's hard, <laughs> you know, and that's even before we get into the whole thing whereby narrative designers are rarely appropriately empowered in the pipeline, am I right? Um, so we don't always have control over the mechanism of consequences, so we have to use sometimes narrative smoke and mirrors things um, just so that the player will feel noticed. Um, so how many folks in here have designers like you've really extended yourself and you've really gone into arguments with your team beyond the scope just to make the system acknowledge something tiny that the player has done because you knew it would matter to them. Like we've all had to have those arguments. Yeah, I think that everyone has put that up. You've gone to bat because you knew the player would, would notice. And, and you can feel that, that player who's gasping to be noticed, even in the tiniest way. So again, it's frankly easier and more natural to make broken crap that's more immediately about just having a slightly complicated desire. Because you know, if there's one thing that we have to get right when resources are slim and it is slowly dawning on you that the rest of the team is not actually going to refine the crude mechanical possibilities of the prototype in any way before charging ahead into production without you, we've all been there. Um, our only job then becomes trying to make sure that the you know delivery of narrative to players is more interesting than and simply having them go from point to point to point. As storytellers, we all really want more for them than perform chore to receive lore, you know, don't we? We want those beats to be satisfying. So I keep coming back to this whole, you know, dissatisfaction thing as a theme. Um, and to me, this is powerful to unpack because on one hand, you know, our players don't seem to be that pleased. Oh no, thank you. They are said they're having problems with the audio. Is this okay now? It's fine for you. Sorry, you're the only, you're the only dissatisfied person. Um, more hands up, though, if I need to provide more auditory satisfaction. 
Um, so dissatisfaction is powerful to unpack because on one hand, our players don't seem to be you know, super satisfied by stories where everyone gets what they want and there's no friction. But on the other hand, they really tend to respond negatively to friction for its own sake. Uh, you know, your game about supposedly the relationship between two people is not always meaningfully deepened by the little red herring plots you made them run around in because you were stumped about how to make non-violent conflict exciting. Um, you know, story doesn't necessarily become more impactful or more rewarding just because we make people whittle away at crafts or tasks or monsters in order to access more of it. Um, so what is what does tend to be satisfying? Like, is it when the pl when we get when the player gets what they want? Um, you know, when we as players are able to predict and plan for a, a desired outcome? Is it when we have to make very tough choices? I mean, obviously, naturally, you know, this varies hugely depending on the game. But you know, also, what if we think bigger than moment to moment satisfaction? What would it be like for us to create stories and designed interactions that increased people's satisfaction with themselves? in relation to the world and its mythologies. I know that sounds really ambitious, um, and I'm not cl claiming to have any one good trick you know, through which we could do that. Um, we as a narrative community are all you know, deeply involved in the iterative work of, of trying to fix that, and it's a problem that we all collaborate on. Um, instead, I wanted to share one of the principles that's been really useful to both Meg and I, um, which is to prioritize a close read of the context in which the player is acting. Um, I often, uh, I end up using the same moment to moment desire analysis in my game design work that tends to be relevant to actors because I trained as an actor in a past life. Um, but you know, we think about multiple things that the player would, might desire in a given context. Um, and we just don't let them have them all. And when a player has multiple irreconcilable goods or things that seem good to them, we can use the choices that they make to tell them things about themselves. Um, because when I talk about an age of dissatisfaction and we look at the depressing post-truth social media climate of distraction and blah, 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 the context of our choices and expressions is one of the largest things that has, has gone missing you know, in modern digital society. Um, you know, for example, everything we say and do now stays out there independently of the emotional or the situational context in which we said it or who we were then versus now. Uh, you can Google context collapse and social media if you're not sure what I mean by this. That's a whole other thing that could be its own talk. But we no longer have as much control as we hope to have over how we experience digital space in our daily lives anymore. Uh, you know, we can be collecting positive attention and social capital through a certain channel one minute, and then the next, something changes and the same channel becomes becomes a threat or a vulnerability. Um, and how can that not be relevant to video games where fundamentally what we do is offer people the chance to be someone in digital space? Um, and that's what we're good at. And you know, the dream of this, the, you know, the, the utopian dream of the internet where we could all be whoever we want to be, that's something everyone has kind of lost control of. Um, but I think kids are going to look to games for that, you know, to Fortnite dances and streaming storytellers. And that's stuff that we know how to do and that we can kind of meet that challenge. Um, and I think that whether you want to make stories for mainstream audiences like Meg and I, or whether you're focused more on a traditional video game fan, um, there's a lot of clues elsewhere in the entertainment climate about what people are looking for from their entertainment entertainment. Um, and those are inspiring Red Queen's design practice a lot, as well as our work individually. Um, a couple years ago, I got to contribute to Reign's Game of Thrones with Nereal. Um, one of the things I got to do was write the Cersei Lannister storylines, which um, was a dream come true for me. So thanks to Francois and Tamara Alio for having me on that project. I think it's wild that Game of Thrones, which is incredibly nerdy and requires like innocent HBO viewers to keep like 500 characters straight, that's the one that went supernova in popular culture. Um, but you know, there's, I think, a pretty clear explanation for me there in that we've got clearly defined houses with strongly identified traits, and then the context around those houses keeps changing. Um, and the way they identify themselves keeps reorienting as a result of that change in context. Um, you know, that which seems effective always has a cost. That which seems moral is generally misguided. Selfishness is necessary to survival, but meanwhile, all the good people die. Um, this, this 
you know, interest as a culture in ambiguity and, and context change and storytelling, I think really speaks to our desire to recapture nuance in discourse in general um, and to recapture the role context has to play in how we interact with each other, how we speak to each other, how we care for each other, um, when we use power and towards whom and for what. Um, so anyone notice you hear way more about astrology than you used to? Yep, once again, wedging a lot more of my woo-woo interest into the game design talk. Um, but in, in the fandom around astrology now, I see this similar need to identify ourselves and connect with one another um, in this world where everything just kind of seems fake and made up. I mean, I, I know astrology is fake too, but you know, it's maybe, it, we're, in a, we're in trouble if astrology is one of the less fake things that we have to relate to each other now. Uh, you know, your astrological sign your Harry Potter house, your Game of Thrones house, whether you're Team Edward or Team Jacob. Like, I'm a Slytherin Lannister Libra, Raphael with Sailor Venus rising. Uh, I'm from Fire Nation, even though I'm an air sign. If I was on Succession, I'd be the angry one who's on drugs. And if I was on American Horror Story, I would be Sarah Paulson. No, but seriously, though, that, that type of tribalism is kind of well suited to the internet age, and it's something people are looking for in their narratives. Um, I think, um, yeah, like astrology is instantly accessible and shareable, um, but it also speaks to our need to, com to find community around entertainment and take ourselves a little less seriously in dialogue in this environment of context collapse. By the way, this is my actual natal chart, so if you wanted to analyze me really intimately, that was your chance. Um, so we keep hearing about the rise of streaming or whatever and you know, more immediate access to television. Uh, the mainstream story consumer is incredibly sophisticated now, um, incredibly voracious. They they don't just want to binge television, they want to critique and participate and discuss and identify. Um, and there's a lot of discussions we see on social media now about, you know, how much control should fans have over an IP. But like, to me, that dragon has already left the barn. Um, people are looking for closer relationships to these characters and these stories and to each other around these things. And of course, that doesn't mean that we all start doing our work by public poll and do storytelling by fan vote. But the point is, we have a great opportunity to be clever here because we are game designers and to start offering them those relationships in new ways. Um, especially if there's a bubble around the streaming television thing, I expect these media partners will need to get creative about how to build that long-term engagement with um, you know, bigger narrative arcs and, and character-driven storytelling. Um, so uh, Meg and I don't really, we haven't talked about Red Queens that much publicly yet because we're still in soft launch. I still have some projects of my own uh, in and out of games. And Meg is currently working on a beautiful narrative-driven um, open-world game set in a desert coming-of-age story called Sable. Um, she's working on that with her fabulous team at Shedworks. I absolutely can't wait to play it, um, and that's her priority for the time being. Um, but what I can tell you now is that we intend to make story games from a very particular basis, which is creating narrative spaces for mainstream entertainment fans to enjoy fresh relationships to the worlds and characters they love on the platforms where they already are, using simple choices choice mechanics, accessible choice mechanics, made richer and more sustainable by, you know, light procedurality, conditionality, IF stuff, because um, both of us uh, have our backgrounds in IF. Um, yeah, I like all those words I just said, too. <laughs> but we'll have to see where it goes. Um, who knows if I know what I'm talking about. Um, in the meantime, though, as Meg and I have been developing Red Queens, we've also been doing um, consulting on projects where there's a harmony of values, doing story support where we can. Um, and doing work as a pair has helped us sort of refine a practice, which kind of we thought we would try to share today, because um, uh, we thought maybe ideas that have been useful for our clients might be interesting for you to use. Um, Again, there's nothing that we can really say yet about our clients, um, but hopefully you'll get to start seeing them soon, unless it all blows up and we don't know what we're talking about, and then like we're just going to disappear. No, <laughs> totally kidding. Um, and I'm kidding deliberately, because I find it really interesting how risky it feels for me as a woman to even joke about being unprofessional. Um, of course, we take our work seriously, um, but we're also trying to find ways to express ourselves and keep humor around our identity and our work these days. Like I did my time being a really serious serious critic and now like I absolutely love genre stuff and character archetypes and the art of the remix like I like revivals I want to do some nice ones you know we're, we're also thinking about original stuff eventually but you know even if it's a complicated thing for a couple of quote unquote you know female diversity hires to do we're consciously committed to luxury romance and joy across everything we do because I think everyone really deserves that stuff in their fiction right now like I got bored of being a snob you know I want us all to have doors 
doorways into fun worlds with hot people. You know, we're thirsty as storytellers, the same way our audiences are thirsty. Um, so I promised some process takeaways. Um, I didn't want to spend a lot of time here trying to offer that type of thing because um, you know, there are a lot of people here in this local scene who are uh, far more experienced than we are in that kind of thing. And it's easy, of course, as well for us to talk about what we do in external relationships when you know, that type of thing is generally more challenging for folks to implement in-house. Every pipeline's different. It's a constant adjustment. I don't know how to tell any one of y'all how to do your job, but um, you might be experiencing dissatisfaction with the lack of concrete takeaways. Um, but bringing it back, um, when I started this talk, I said that um, the thing that I really liked most about Meg's work um, as a fan and now as a collaborator is um, you know, our interest in complicating players' desires. And I think the challenge that we've seen the most, uh, both together and separately, is that many people still think of a narrative experience of a narrative game as one in which the player mostly just follows the story. Um, we expect the Oh, it's going again. <clears throat> All right. I'll try to stand up straight and hold very still. How's that? Good? Yeah, thank you, everybody. So I think the challenge that we've seen um, the most, both together and separately, is that many people still view a narrative experience as one in which there's sort of nothing to do but follow the story. We think they're going to sit back and read, or they do a lot of passive non-conflict verbs. Um, and we see this time and again, the notion that narrative and conflict are somehow in opposition to each other, that rather than you know essential to one another. And this is not uh, original thought of mine or anything. Um, we sometimes encounter counter an assumption that games without combat are necessarily non-violent or that they're just talking as if there can't be conflict and intimacy or you know violence in speech. Um, anyone who has participated in any political issue online before has probably now come to understand there's scope for a great deal of intensity and threat in text interactions. Um, it is now not really enough for me personally to play a game just to follow a story. Um, you know, I definitely don't want to get into any kind of prescriptive language about which kinds of games are and aren't valid or what is and isn't a game. It's just for me personally, my interests, um, what I want to play and create. I find the most interesting narrative moments are when the player has conflicting objectives and when there's something they desire and something that's at risk. Um, and probably the most common point of feedback we end up having to give to our clients both separately and together, involves making the narrative more active. Um, the player must feel like they're making decisions that move the story along rather than perf performing chores to unlock more story. Um, that also seems kind of obvious, I'm afraid, but it's a hurdle that I still do encounter, and I'm sure you know a lot of folks in here can also relate. Um, and I'm sure everyone in this room shares my view that we can do meaningful you know, conflict with, through narrative design. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you in here are acquainted with that sense of dis dissatisfaction when you struggle to be able to express yourself through the design um, despite your best intentions and through no fault of your own. Has this ever happened to you? Yeah, it's, it's kind of part of what we do, I think. See, bringing it back, I complicated your desire so you would be satisfied when I got back on topic. Hey. Um, but yeah, one big thing that, that has not failed Meg and I yet when it comes to bringing story and mechanics into line with each other and getting buy-in from our clients is um, to look first at the context in which the player is approaching the story and then see if we can do something expressive with that. Um, so what does that mean? In this totally unscientific case, we start a bit closer to the experience itself. Uh, I'm using context and complication to explore how I engage the player in a story uh, and the thinking that I try to bring to my teams. You know, a lot of games begin with desire. We show the player something that they want and then we let them work out how to get it. Uh, and then we use context to kind of, you know, add stakes or feelings around that desire. Um, and then often what games do is they keep reminding you of the context your desire is supposed to have. Like, oh, you want to explore the ship, but the lights keep flickering and there's blood on the wall, so you should be scared of your desire. Or, you know, you have this fabulous power, but something in the world <clears throat> keeps reminding you that you're not supposed to use it. Um, so in very simplistic terms, we tend to use context to make play players feel bad about what they want so that we don't just frictionally deliver their desires because that would be boring. But, you know, is making them feel bad always the best way to create friction? Um, it's weird how often, I think, as game designers, we use guilt and regret about power as an emotional delivery mechanism in games, isn't it? Um, and I think that's because when we make fantasy, 
communities. You know, power is always going to be part of that. Um, and so instead of using context to make powerful people feel bad, maybe we could use context to take the player's power away or to do or ask them to do something interesting or conscientious with it. Um, and that's where complication comes in for me. Something else the player wants in a given context. And hopefully, in a good story, the context changes often, um, thereby shifting that balance of desires. You know, you have a fabulous power, and the world doesn't want you to use it. Uh, but if you don't, your rival will. Uh, you really want to see what's around the next corner, even though it's scary, because there's a need greater than your own involved. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of narrative moments are about a conflict between what we told the player to want and how we told them to feel. Um, but good narrative moments to me ask players to you know, prioritize different goals and desires in order to orient themselves against an existing conflict or to express themselves in that conflict. Um, so I won't spend too much time talking about my own work on Range Her Majesty, which was a while ago now. Um, if you are interested in the details of how I approach that, my GDC talk covers it pretty well. Um, but I hate, yeah. Um, so the Reigns games are about balance excuse me, the uh, Reigns games are about balancing four different values to avoid death as long as possible. Um, and in Her Majesty, I started from that context to, cre to hopefully create, a, you know, I thought that was a cool context to create an experience about the unstable demands and double standards around being a woman. Um, and then also to express some humor around it too. Um, and one of the reasons I was super excited to work on the Reigns games is this Tinder-inspired interface that it uses. Um, the swiping left and right and the card mechanic was so fruitful for me because it was expressive of that context in which I was working, you know, whereby an irritated queen swipes left all day on every wheedling counselor and incompetent lord that's sliding into her DMs. Like, even just the act of swiping no was expressive to me as a woman even before I got into the, you know, mechanics of the game. Um, I think there's so much uh, inspiration on the platforms that people are already using. Um, and when I was working on Her Majesty, I thought a lot about Game of Thrones because the, mechan the brutal mechanics were such a natural fit. Um, and the trapped and angry, marginalized individuals of that story were, were often an inspiration in Her Majesty. And of course, HBO obviously saw the same similarities with the Reigns series since we, you know, we got to make Reigns Game of Thrones, which was amazing. Something lots of people don't know is that Nereal, the studio, is very small. Uh, the core team was two people while I was working with them on this, and um, it's absolutely amazing that an indie team gets to reinterpret Game of Thrones in like a modern and a non-literal context. It's a different way of thinking about how we do adaptation, um, and and I that's where I'm starting to think of as well about you know what we can do with games and other media. Um, I think that we, importantly, we now have an audience that's accustomed to devices. They already watch TV with their phone in hand while messaging people. Um, they're already experiencing modern mainstream stream narratives on mobile. Um, and I think there's creative ways to use the mobile platform in particular to make inroads into these big seasonal character-driven universes. Um, so the main reason Fifty Shades is so terrible is that you know, while the main characters desire for each other is complicated by their difference in power, their interest in each other has no other plausible context. Like there's nothing to explain why this girl has nothing else going on in her life. There's nothing to explain why this billionaire who's into kink is pursuing her and her only despite their conflicting desires. Um, and just another thing, imagine that story without him being rich then he's just a criminal, you know? Like, the solution must lie in the context into which the novel was released, the unique dissatisfaction of the readers. Um, and context is not just what's going on inside the software. I mean the entire context, including the user's relationship to a platform or to an input. Um, this includes the social atmosphere around the player and around the themes of the game, uh, the behaviors that you're asking them to do and what those mean. Like my, personally, my explicit thesis is I want to make games for like stoned people who are on Netflix binges. Um, I want to wa make games for women watching murder marathons, you know, with the world on their mind and the phone in their hand. Um, and thinking about where my audience is going to be um, and who they are and what else they have been doing has a huge influence on how I approach the design of the story. Um, one thing I really did enjoy about the time I spent working on Love Island with the Fusebox team in London, Love Island is on like 
six to six to eight nights a week in the uh, sorry it's on six nights a week in the UK for about six to eight weeks um, it's a huge cultural event people are starting to get into it here as well so I had that experience of having the game version coming out episodically while I watch the show which also lets me vote on the real-time stuff that happens to the characters and I was like wow I'm finally living in that transmedia future that everyone promised me when I was a young woman coming to game design conferences um, but the thing I liked most about working with Fusebox was their commitment to representing certain values through the Love Island game, even if those values are not always necessarily a huge part of that brand. Um, it was important to the team to show characters talking about topics from you know, male intimacy and mental health care to co different cultural and racial backgrounds to struggles with sexuality and ways of recognizing abusive relationships. Um, and I think that this is an example of being able to put something meaningful into a story where people don't necessarily expect it. It doesn't take away from their enjoyment, but it respects their needs as viewers. Um, and that means that the stories they enjoy can help them gain context on their own lives. And for some of our players, those are, this is going to be their introduction to those themes. We have the opportunity as makers of games to create new desires in unexpected contexts. And like, I don't think anyone's really satisfied by the same like mayo squirt geek hero stories anymore. I mean, not that there's not everyone should have entertainment that's targeted at them. But like, if you look at the landscape, it's becoming clearer and clearer. Um, and this makes me excited for the future, to think about what else we can do for these fans and where we can go from here. Um, it doesn't actually sound like this has a lot to do with dissatisfaction. It sounds like, actually, I want to cater to fandom more, and I do. Like, you want to be the one your favorite character is illicitly texting during the Friday season two premiere. Like, I want that for you, you know? Um, but we don't think that satisfying the audience necessarily means empowering them at the cost of self-reflection. Um, in fact, the opposite. Now more than ever, we think that stories have the chance to help people, especially younger people, hone their empathetic abilities for the trials to come. That being said, I don't want to return to the problematic notion of empathy games. Um, story games are valuable in their own right, whether they give, you know, whether they teach you how to be more caring or not. Stories are valuable. Um, and by offering our players the chance to explore their identities and complicate their desires, especially if these are not always empowering, we can contribute something positive in the atmosphere. Um, if that's something that interests you too and you want to talk more, please get in touch. I'm sorry this wasn't the talk I wanted to give to you today, but I hope some of it um, at least sparked some inspiration for you. I'm already over time, so unfortunately I cannot take questions, but please write down my email address if you uh, have any. Thank you for your time. Sorry for the audio difficulties. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.